Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Venda La Vida to discuss We Run the Tides, an achingly beautiful story of female friendship, betrayal, and a mysterious disappearance set in the changing landscape of San Francisco. Venda La Vida is the award-winning author of six books, including Let the Northern Lights Erase Your Name and The Divers Clothes Lie Empty. She is a founding editor of The Believer magazine and co-editor of The Believer Book of Writers Talking to Writers in Confidence, or The Appearance of Confidence, a collection of interviews with musicians. She was a founding board member of 826 Valencia, the San Francisco Writing Center for Young People, and lives in the Bay Area with her family. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Sarah Ladipo Manica. Sarah is a novelist, short story writer, essayist, and founding books editor for Aussie.com. Sarah currently serves as board president for the Women's Writing Residency, Hedgebrook, and is the creator and host of the Museum of the African Diaspora's Conversations Across the Diaspora. Sarah is a fellow of the Royal Arts of Society of Arts, a San Francisco Public Library Laureate, and a member of the National Book Critics Circle. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of We Run the Tides from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hello. Hello. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Nice to see you. Good to see you too, Vendela. And thank you to Books and Books. This is great. Um, so here we are. Uh, Vendela, I don't. <laughs> not not in are. Miami. We're both in the Bay Area. I know. I wish we were in Miami. We can kind Next of. Year. We can pretend. Yes. <laughs> so, Vandela, I don't know if you remember, but a couple of years ago when your latest book came out and I had just read your book, I, at the end of the book, I stood up and I applauded. I was just uh -huh. so excited. And then that was this book, oh, The Diver's Clothes Lie Empty. And I applauded just because I was so pulled into the story. The craft of your writing was incredible. And I had the same response to We Run the Tides. Um, but with this one, I applauded at the very beginning. And I also applauded at the very end. And I applauded at the very beginning because I just felt myself sucked into the story from the get-go, from sentence one. And as a writer, I was also just in great, just enthralled by the craft of your writing and you do amazing things with point of view and yes so it was just it was a book that I didn't want to put down so I just had to start off by saying that. Well that's so funny Sarah because I today I was looking through a copy that you signed to me of your novel of Independence and I was <laughs> marveling at the first paragraph um, which I love so much and so um, yes so I am um, mutually appreciative of your first paragraph which I wish I could read right now, but maybe I'll let everyone else get the book and then they can read this first paragraph, which is totally genius. So. Thank, thank you, Vendela. And that's it on anything that I've okay. written. This okay. is about you. Okay. <laughs> um, so another thing that was just so compelling about this book was that this, this book is set in San Francisco. So I had this sort of dual feeling of loving it because I live in San Francisco and I've lived here for many years now. And so there was a familiarity to it. But there was also a sense of novelty as well, because the area where most of the book is set is in the Seacliff neighborhood, which San Francisco is very small, but I don't know that neighborhood very well at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to start there. I wanted to start with place mm -hmm. and say, this is the first time that you have set a novel in San Francisco. You set your novels in all all different amazing places. The last one was set in Morocco and in Casablanca. And I just wanted to ask why San Francisco, San Francisco of the 1980s, why set a book in San Francisco now? 
Well, it's funny because I didn't set out trying to write a book about San Francisco. I'm one of those people who never plots my books out. I know that pe some people have like intimate, you know, intricate, um, like all these cards all over their offices with like outlines and so forth and index cards telling them what they're going to do and which chapter and what's going to happen. I am not that kind of writer. Um, I don't plan anything out. I didn't plan to write a book in San Francisco. And what happened was the day after the 2016 election when Trump was elected, I started writing a nonfiction book about about lying and about just out of coincidentally. Um, and I, I was being very obsessed with uh, the Swedish American philosopher Cicela Bach and her theories on lying and how there's a you know, form of pollution that happens with lying. And so I worked on this nonfiction book for about a year. And um, then I decided I actually wanted to turn into fiction. And I thought, well, who better to embody lying and shape shifting than teenage girls who are at that age when that's not only expected of them, but kind of just, I almost think it's required. Like I think, I think that lying and shape shifting is something you should do as a teenage girl when you're trying on these new identities. And so soon my book about lying and Trump morphed into a book about um, teenage girls in the 80s in San Francisco, because San Francisco is also, you know, going through a transition in the 80s. And, you know, it was no longer the city, the city it had been known for in the 70s, and it was no longer the city it's known as now. And so I, um, I chose teenage girls, San Francisco in the 80s, and put them together, and that's how it happened. Well, it was interesting for me reading the book as well, because I've always been enthralled with San Francisco of the 80s, because I came here in the sort of mid late 90s. Mm -hmm. And I would hear all these stories about the 80s, and including stories about wonderful San Francisco based writers, including yourself, mm -hmm. and you know, Vandela Vida growing up in San Francisco, wow. and I would heard all these stories. And so it was sort of an added treat for me to go back to the 80s of uh, San Francisco. But so coming back to the actual book, another, and, I, and I'm enthusing so much about this book, I will stop at some point, but um, another thing that's just wonderful about the book is it's, it's a book that can be read on many levels. It's a coming of age story. It feels like a love story to San Francisco. It's a book about friendship. And it also feels very allegorical. And you were just talking about lies and fabrications. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a story about what happens when you keep running and running and running with a lie. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to necessarily revisit what's happened in America over the past four years, but this is the time in which you were writing this story, mm -hmm. a story in which lying and the implications of lying, the consequences of lying and so forth, lie at the heart of the novel. So what was it like writing this novel during the last four years in America? Um, well, I want to say that, first of all, it's interesting that you're interested in San Francisco of the 80s, because growing up in San Francisco in the 80s, I was interested in San Francisco of the 70s. <laughs> you're always interested. You always feel like you missed the party in some way. <laughs> you, know, you feel like you're, just, you're arriving when like the music's bad and there's like pretzels that are broken and you know covered in beer, but whatever time it is. But I definitely felt that way growing up in the 80s. But I will say, Sarah, one thing that helped me write this book is we actually, during um, the Trump administration, um, we couldn't quite take it at a certain point, and we moved to um, an island off of Morocco, actually, off the Spanish island, um, Gran Canaria, um, for a for semester, for a kid's um, semester of school. And it wasn't until I went there that I was really felt that I could write about San Francisco in a, from a distance. I was seeing everything from a distance, and I'm, I don't know if you feel that way, too, if it's easier to write about other places when you're away from them. But I definitely found that. And I became really obsessed with um, Edith Wharton's books when I was there, because she wrote writes so well about America and the difference between America and Europe. And I just felt like I just had this perspective on um, on California too that I hadn't had before. And so that's why, it was, that's what enabled me to write about it was actually leaving, leaving the country. Mm -hmm. Well, I think I'm going to ask you if you wouldn't mind to read a short section. And this section is illustrative of uh, you know, young young women fabricating stories. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, let's have you read this section that comes towards the beginning of the book. And then afterwards, perhaps we can talk a little bit more about this section. Okay, great. This is a um, section that Sarah asked me to read. I'm really glad she did because I have not read this aloud. Um, so hopefully I know how to pronounce all the words. So Maria Fabiola, this is um, the second chapter of the book. So you haven't missed that much. Maria Fabiola and I have been best friends since we were in kindergarten at Sprague, and we've been placed in different homerooms almost every year. Separately, we are good girls. We behave. Together, some strange alchemy occurs, and we are trouble. 
This happens at school and it happens when we're not at school. Last year, I got into trouble with my parents and my neighbors for telling a lie that involved her. Maria Fabiola and I were selling lemon lemonade. We weren't getting many customers in front of my house. So we moved to our stand in, in front of a bigger one on a corner. A Chevy full of teenage boys pulled up and the boy in the passenger seat leaned out the window, window to talk to us. If that's your house, can we marry you when you're older? He said. Maria Fabiola and I looked at each other and laughed. We didn't correct their assumption. We'll take that as a yes, the boy said. As the car drove off, he yelled out the window, we'll be back. To some, that might sound like a threat, but to us, it was a promise. Mrs. Sheridan, a neighbor I'd known for most of my life, was our first customer. What do we have here today, Eulaby? That's the protagonist, the narrator, Eulaby. Lemonade, I said, pointing to the sign that said, lemonade. She bought one cup, which she drank on the spot, and then bought a second. And what's your name, she said to Maria Fabiola. Maria Fabiola. I would have thought Mrs. Sheridan might recognize her from all the time she'd been in my house, but apparently not. Her non-recognition of Maria Fabiola made me look at my friend differently. And for the first time, I saw what everyone else must be seeing. She was no longer who she used to be. Her hair, once straight, had become wavy. Her body had swelled, stretching the fabric of her shirt and the back pockets of her jeans. So now the pockets tilted inward toward each other at an angle. The lie flew out of my mouth, a fabrication intended to collapse the distance spreading between us. Maria Fabiola is not just my friend, I said to Mrs. Sheridan. My parents recently adopted her. She's my new sister. Mrs. Sheridan, who wore a large cross on a thin chain around her neck, thought this was wonderful news. I did too. It was hard at first to see what Maria Fabiola thought of my lie. Her full lips were pillowed together into a pout, but she began to repeat the fib and then embrace it, and this pleased me. We proceeded to walk around the block, ringing the doorbells and knocking the knockers, and I introduced Maria Fabiola to every neighbor as my new adopted sister. We rang a few more doorbells, almost all of which were answered. Did no one in Seacliff work? Each neighbor accepted our lie as truth. The ease of deception made the lying less fun, so we stopped and returned to my house to get a snack. We made ants on a log, peanut butter and celery with raisins on top. I didn't know you were such a good liar, Maria Fabiola said. She seemed to be evaluating me with new eyes. I didn't either, I said. We continued eating without talking, the snap of the celery, the only noise. Maria Fabiola's mom came to pick her up in a black Volvo. Her mother had dark hair and wore large sunglasses so opaque that sometimes it appeared she had difficulty seeing through the lenses. She often lifted them up in an attempt to get a better view and let them fall back down over her eyes as though disappointed at what things really looked like. She quickly whisked Maria Fabiola away I hope nobody saw her leave. Maria Fabiola's departure had no plan and no part in the narrative of my newly fabricated family life. And I'll stop there. I, I think that's just, it's wonderful. It illustrates, you know, this, this shifting identities and, and lying, um, but also just you the sense of humor that you have when you write. And um, this is also just something that I, I love about your work. You, you as a person sort of have this very, to me, it almost feels like a very British deadpan sense of humor. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's there. It's there in the way that you name your characters. It's there in the way that you describe characters. It's there in situational comedy. Um, so um, I'm going to flip back to the dedication of the book where you say, this also made me laugh and smile. You say, this book is dedicated to my childhood friends and teachers who will immediately recognize that this is a work of fiction. Um, and that made me smile. But coming back to the piece that you read, am I correct in thinking that this actually, something like this happened in yeah. your life? Well, so I'll say two things. So one thing about the dedication, I actually I did want to make sure that my, my friends and teachers who read it would start reading and be like, Wait, this is because there are things that are similar to our childhood, and I grew up in San Francisco. But I wanted to make sure that no one was reading it as, um, as fact. You know, there are these kidnappings that happen in the book, and there were no kidnappings that happened that rocked our childhoods the same way. Um, so there, obviously, as a fiction writer, and you know this as well as anybody, you take you take very you take liberties with what the truth, and you you lie. So I guess it's a very meta thing. I'm lying about a book about lying. Um, but yeah, this example, but this. Um, second chapter was actually taken from something in my own life where I pretended somebody was my sister. I wasn't someone like Maria Fabiola, but 
I plagiarized myself basically from my own life story to um, to kind of express that desire you have when you're when you're maybe 13 or 14 and you feel like a friend is maybe getting away from you and you want to do anything to collapse that distance. And even if it takes a lie, you'll do that. And so this is something that happened in my life. It's actually a different kind of person than Maria Fabiola. I didn't have a Maria Fabiola in my childhood, but I feel like everyone's had a Maria Fabiola type friend in their lives. And if you read the book, you'll see that she's a very fabulous um, spinner of, of lies. She's a fabulous person and, she, and everyone's kind of becomes captivated by both her beauty and her just her ability to make everything more fun and up the ante and make everything more chaotic and exciting, especially for a teenager. That's a really you know wonderful attribute in a friend. But I um I the, the lie I actually told when I was that age was about a, a friend of mine who was part of more like the hippie culture in San Francisco, and she had that part of her life. And she her mom had really long hair and was really beautiful and ate fondue on pillows on the floor with her boyfriend and. And I wanted, I, I felt like that was such a wonderful world that I had not been introduced to. And I wanted to collapse the space between us and be part of the 70s. And so thus I made her my pretend sister. And I also got in a lot of trouble for lying about that. So I'll share that. But, so the lying part though, you know, the funny thing about lying is that it is like, it, it does become a form of pollution. So in the book, when we run the tides, um, Yulibi tells the first lie that Maria Fabiola is her sister. And then Maria Fabiola kind of takes it from there. That moment that you asked me to read when she says, I never realized you were such a good liar. She kind of is looking at her with new eyes. It's like she's learned at that moment that she can lie too. And so there's this thing that happens where the lies just get passed along as I think they do in real, in real life too, especially among young girls. Yes, and I'm also tempted to say also amongst politicians. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Lies are contagious, right? They really are. You know, I've been thinking so much about lies in the last few years and how people lie. I think when you get close to their secret, sometimes you're wondering why someone's lying about something. It does not seem like they worth lying about, and you realize they're getting it close to something they don't want you to know. And that was really fun for me to explore in this book. Is thinking what is everyone's, you know, secret in this book? What's what's the most scary to them? most scary thing that could be revealed about them. And that's why are they protecting it? Mm -hmm. And the lengths to which people will go to protect. Um, yeah, and just building layer upon layer upon layer. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to humor. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to, if it's okay with you, just read a tiny, a short section. Um, one of many, many sections that just had me laughing so much. Okay. What, 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 one of the things that I particularly enjoyed was your use of, for want of a better word, swinglish, um, you, you know, talking about Swedish Americans and Swedish culture and, and humor in the language, humor in customs. And I, I really enjoyed that. And uh, Eula B's, the protagonist's mother has a sewing group that was originally uh, called the Stitch and Bitch Sewing Group. And then it kind of devolved into the Bitch and Bitch mm -hmm. Sewing Group. Yeah. And um, so this, here's a little description of the group. Uh, there are a dozen members of the Bitch and Bitch. Many of them have the same name. So each woman has been given an adjective. There's Tall Mia, Short Mia, Fat Ula, Thin Ula, whose California license plates say Ooh La La. Loud Lisa and Quiet Lisa, they really call themselves by these names. Things got complicated when Fat Ula did a juice fast and dropped a couple dress sizes and Thin Ula gained weight during menopause, but no one bothered to change their monikers, not even Fat and Thin Ula themselves. My mother is the only Greta. I mean, it's just uh, there you're having fun on the page and the reader's having fun reading uh, reading your words as well so um thank you for and I, that. yeah thank you for announcing ula right you have a really you're really good accents oh good oh, well, <laughs> i was just winging it winging it <laughs> um so how do you write humor so well what's yeah. the secret well i'm glad you find it funny i um i think that i've always wanted to write a have a palette for a book where i could incorporate more humor so in some of my previous novels, like in Let the Northern Lights Erase Your Name, it starts with a really dark comedy, but there's a certain point after which something really terrible happens to the narrator. The narrator rather discovers something terrible about herself, and there's no room for humor anymore in the book. And I even had to 
have a sign over my desk when I was writing that said like, you can't be funny anymore. Like stop, stop with the jokes because the jokes weren't working in the second part of the book if the tone wasn't right. And so, it was a, um, so with this book, I really knew when I started it, I wanted to have a palette that can incorporate humor the whole way through. And an all girls school in the eighties seemed like the right palette for that, um, seemed right for humor. And um, in terms of wanting to write humor, you know, I, I write really early in the morning. I wake up, when I'm working on a book, I work at, wake up at 4.30 in the morning. And I, cause I love that time when you're not quite, the world's not awake and you're not quite awake. And so you are, feel a little freer to experiment with things. And so I'll just allow myself to write whatever I want, whatever I think is funny and not second guess myself at that time and go back at it later and see if it's funny. And um, I live with the writers. My husband was my first reader. And so when I give him stuff to read, I'll give it to him. And then I'll pretend I'm going out or I can't from a different part of the house, but I'll really just be listening at, the, at the, my office door to hear if he's laughing. Cause that's, I think the only way you really know if something is, is funny or not. And it, it's surprising. There's so many times you think you're being funny and, and you're not. <laughs> so, and, and there are times when you are really gratified that something paid off. So I'm glad that you found that, that scene funny, but for every, you know, I think for every joke I wrote, there was probably, probably cut a lot that didn't quite, didn't quite work. They were only funny to me. And um, that doesn't quite work in a book. Oh, well, I'm just thinking getting up at 4.30, that does not sound like funny. That's no <laughs> joke. But anyway, <laughs> I am greatly in great admiration of you for getting up. That's good. When do you write? Do you write? It doesn't matter what time uh, you write? We'll talk about me another time. Okay. Uh, okay. But um, I, I strive to get up at, let's say, okay. 4.30. That sounds like a good plan. I'll call you. I'll call you tomorrow morning. Okay. 4.30. <laughs> You might get my voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that means you're hard at work. Uh, yeah, yeah, exa exactly. Um, Vendely, you're very good in this book at getting into the heads of adolescent young women, young girls, uh, teenagers, and um, again, there are so many passages that uh, I'd love to go to, but there's one, but. Just as an example, there's a passage, um, let's see, actually not, not too much further after the passage that I just read, where Eula B is thinking about love. Um, you know, what is love sort of, she doesn't necessarily say it that way, but she is thinking about what constitutes love. And that is something that we, we all think about no matter what age. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, there's just this wonderful description where she's seen, she's thinking about the film Out of Africa. And she's thinking about a particular scene with Robert Redford, when Robert Redford washes Meryl Streep's hair. And then you have Eulaby saying, now that I thought is love. And Meryl Streep's skin looked incredible. <laughs> and, and then you have, I mean, this is also the subtlety of your humor it's kind of a knife edge. It's not really funny, but it's kind of funny because then you have your character, Eulaby, looking at her face and she's got acne mm -hmm. and then she does push-ups or sit-ups, you know, this sort of whole body image thing. And then she finds herself thinking, you, basically you just have to buy the book and read the book. But anyway, I'm just quick, she finds herself thinking about her mother mm -hmm. and her mother washing her hair. And it's just, that is like, that is love, even though she's not mm -hmm. necessarily saying it's love. Um, and it's just so beautiful. I get. I guess I'm just saying. How how have you managed to go back in time? I know you have a daughter that's of this age, but um, to really inhabit the way that young women think, which is not to say that young women think all the same. Of course not. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really it's very believable and authentic in the way that you write these characters and their age. Well, thank you for that. I, you know, I, the character wasn't based on my, on me. Um, and it wasn't based and I didn't, I deliberately didn't go back to my diaries to read what I was doing at that age. Cause I didn't want to be too influenced by my own personality. I wanted Eulabi to be her own person and with her own foibles and, and desires. But I did start writing this book, you know, after Trump was elected. And also when my daughter was turning about 12, she's 15 now. So three years ago. And I, I, Feel like you always i have a really friend therapist friends really smart therapist friends say that you always relive the ages that your children are going through and i never really believed it until my daughter turned 12 and i started thinking oh now i know it's ahead of her 
her. And what I really started noticing and remembering was just that saturation of feeling you experience from that age where like everything means so much. And like, and it's not, it's not that everything means so much. It's actually like the strangest thing with like the hat that you wear to a party means more than sometimes like even being at the party. It's like all these things mean so much and yet the they're out of balance. Like what's important is it actually has its own, you know, own, own value system. And so that's what I started to remember when I was like, when I saw my daughter turn 12 and just the importance of friendship and just how, yeah, and the feeling that you know that you want and you know that you want to love and you don't know what it is yet. So there is this confusion of wanting to, you know, emulate the love that you see Robert Redford giving to Meryl Streep on screen, but also knowing that love is the feeling of your mother washing your hair and how that all gets combined into your sense and your fascination with what love could be. And you're just wondering when, when it's going to happen to you. You know, you're just like walking around waiting for it. Not what it feels like, but hoping you'll know when, you, when it hits you. So that's what I was trying to get back to with that, with that scene. And it was just so masterfully written and so beautifully written um, as is so many passages. You know, talking about young girls, I another th sort of th theme or idea that's explored, touched on in the book is the way that young women are taught to see themselves through the male gaze. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it was like, again, writing about this characters of this age, thinking back to your own childhood mm -hmm. and raising children in this who are of this age, have things changed? You know, I think they have, Sarah. I, you know, I wasn't even planning on putting so much about the male gaze into the, into the book, but I started thinking when I was writing it and going back in time in the 80s, just realizing how much we were taught to see things, especially in literature. You know, I was an English major, and even the books I was taught early on um, in college were really about like men's male perspective, or even the books I emulated, like, you know, Kutsia's work or Philip Roth. And I still, you know, I still really love reading Philip Roth, but it's so, it's almost perplexing to me why I liked some of the writers I did so much when I was 21. And I wondered how much it was just that I was taught to like that kind of writing. Um, you know, not necessarily the writing itself, but the first, you know, so many of the books were about men of a certain age looking at women of a certain age. And why was I so interested in that? I realized I'd really been taught that. Um, I did have really good English um, teachers, both in grade school and high school, um, really good teachers. And but I thought it'd be fun in the book to kind of talk about the way that girls are taught to think about themselves in literature and movies at that age. You know, you, you look back at some of the movies, there's some films I watch with my kids and I can't believe that they were even made. You know, you can't believe that some of the ways that they were taught to, you were, and teenage girls just watched people and thought, okay, this is, this is how the world is. And I, and so amazing to me that that is actually what was taught and what was created. And so with the character in the book, I created this English teacher named Mr. London, who is this teacher at the all-girls school. He's a little too young to be teaching there. You know, he's, there, you, he's that age difference where he probably should be teaching, um, he's probably waiting a few more years be te before teaching an all-girls school. But he has a lot of influence on them and, and he he grades Eula B, he gives her a bad grade because she doesn't understand Franny and Zoe, a book about two girls, and he doesn't think that she understands it. And, um, and so that's what I was kind of having fun with that as well. Just what you're taught as a, at a girl, as a girl, school as a girl by male teachers. This is a little aside, but I just thought I would share, I thought you might find it interesting. Um, Meryl Streep, when she was filming that uh, out of Africa, was filming it in Nairobi or in Kenya, not necessarily Nairobi, but uh -huh. she, she came to get her hair done in Nairobi. And it just so happened she came to get her hair done at the same time that my mom was having her hair no. done. So I remember, and I think it was oh 82, 83, around the time that you're writing, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, this was my one claim to fame. I didn't necessarily think about that scene and if, yeah. if that was love, but there was something about love and fame and celebrity that just, that was my little story connected well, to Meryl Streep. I love that. How did you find out? Did your mom tell you or did, the, did everyone know that she was there getting her hair done or how did it, how did that information get to you? Well, I think the funny thing, so I, I don't really think I knew who Meryl Streep was at that time or even how significant it was, but my mom must have said something. And then I think I said something to someone and everyone was like, oh, and, and, and the story just kept getting better and better, particularly when I'd left Kenya. I mean, this, this again comes to kind of fabricating things. You know, when I left Kenya, and at first of all, everyone's like, oh, you lived in Kenya, you know, there's all the, you know, the animals and so forth, thinking about out of Africa. And you, and then I, then I probably said, I met Meryl Streep, probably. Right. 
you know. Um, <laughs> so it kind of got a little bit more exaggerated. Yeah. So anyway, then again, that's, that's kind of great. one of the delights of reading. You know, we all bring our different experiences. And so as you're describing that scene, I'm, I'm also thinking about my childhood and my brush, my brush with fame. Um, <laughs> that I exaggerated. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> um, so I can see I'm already running out of time and I don't want to hog all the time, but I do want to just ask a couple more questions before mm -hmm. we invite um, others to ask questions. And if you don't ask questions, I'm just going to keep talking because I just love talking about this book. So another thing that you're so good at, Vandela, is at evoking senses, whether it's music, um, so at the end of your last book, I was singing the Aretha Franklin song. And if you don't know why, you've got to read the book. Um, and there's a song that runs through this novel. Um, smell is a sense that you, you draw on a lot, which I just love. Um, yeah, I, I think particularly smell in this book, it sounds funny, but the, from the Chinese spice cabinet to the way that Eula B almost sort of sniffs out guys you know one smells of tide <laughs> one smells of tide because his mother doesn't dilute tide in the way that her mom dilutes tide and there's another guy i think axel who she she smells before she sees because she can mm -hmm. smell his cologne and again you know that's you know the sense of smell is something that i as a person that i'm yeah you know, i don't I, the more I talk about this, the more it sounds it sounds ridiculous. No, but anyway, I I, I'm a small person too. So. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I love that. Um, so is I guess my question is, you know, is that something you were consciously thinking about? Yeah, or is it, just... it is something I'm consciously thinking about. I, you know, I write with my candle. Like my, I can't I have to have my office smell a certain way. It has to smell like this candle. Oh, and I, I have to like keep it stocked. I know it sounds sounds funny. A friend of mine joked. I went to her house for a party, and she had this this <laughs> candle burning, and it kind of made me like have this associative Pavlovian response that I wanted to get to work, you know, oh. <laughs> just like, just like I can't use that part candle anymore, but I, I have um, a really strong sense of smell. And, I, and for a while, I actually was really obsessed with how little smell there was in literature. And I wrote a piece for Slate, maybe gosh, more than 10 years ago now about, I think the title was something like, has literature lost its sense of smell? And talking about how, as we, you know, if you look back in like 19th century, 18th century literature before people, before there were sewer, you know, garbage systems and sewer systems in place the way they are now, smell was a much bigger part of of, um, of books and literature, and you, many more descriptions about how something smelled, not just flowers, but really bad smells as well. And so that's something I'm really conscious of in terms of trying to put people in in literally in the book to make them experience it as this, not just what you're hearing or seeing, but what what something smells like. Mm -hmm. I know with this yeah. tide thing, I'm glad you mentioned that. The tide comment, I was trying to show that, you know, Eulabi's parents are immigrants and they're very, they're a little stingy about a lot of things. And so diluting the tide felt like something that they would do. And then the fact that she would notice that the boy she's like, she likes his mother doesn't dilute the tide felt like it was getting a lot of different things, not just smell, but also a little bit of class and culture. And yeah. No, absolutely. And when I, earlier on, when I was talking about humor and I was talking about Swinglish and Swedish and English and the, the, the immigrant experience as well, the way that you, that's also just subtly woven in um, is, is brilliant. And um, I really enjoyed that too. Thank you. Um, so Vandela, you mentioned earlier that you are, you're married to a writer mm -hmm. and your eldest child is also a writer. I know because you have mentioned that she gave this book its title, oh, which yeah. is fabulous. Um, but also a runner, which I think is part of long distance runner. So I think it's not a coincidence that she read the book. And she told me two things. She said there should be more birthday parties because when you're 13, birthday parties are really important. So I put a few more birthday party <laughs> mentions of birthday parties in. And then she she came up with the title when I had some other um, more pretentious titles that I didn't. I didn't like and my publisher didn't like so yeah can you can you share one or two of those pretentious titles well one of them was a title i tried to use for my first book for first novel many years ago called the raft of the medusa based on that painting by jericho i just love raft of the medusa and i thought maybe it would work just maybe it would work for this book because you know, it's women's as medusas are all on a metaphorical raft and then it didn't work for this book and then i also then i had another um there's a poem a 1917 poem by a poet named Vashon, I think is his last name. And um, 
I took a line from it and wanted to call the book The Sea Maid's Children. Um, because he's talking about San Francisco, it's a poem about San Francisco, and I thought that I put it in the beginning and used that, and that just no one could really remember it. The Sea Maid's Children it was hard to say, it became a tongue twister if you said it too many times. So, um, I was I was stuck for a little bit, and my daughter came up with that title, and I thought I like that. I think it's I think it's a brilliant title, and for me, again, I, I'm fitting this into my box of this book being so it is so of the moment. It's it's a book for our times, and for me, I read the title as we run almost like we run with lies as well. Okay. All right, yeah. There's something about that that fits very well. Mm -hmm. um, but my question was, what is it like to live in a household of writers? Of writers, um, you know, I've been married to Dave for twenty, been together for twenty years now. So I don't, I don't notice it. I don't know what it's like to not be married to a writer. Um, it is really nice because, as I was mentioning, if you have something you want someone to read, they're there and they're accessible, and they kind of have to read it right away because otherwise, you know, they can't just say they don't have time and then like watch a movie um but yeah we've just figured i don't know we just figured out how to negotiate it i have an office that looks kind of like an adult office and he has a filthy garage where he works so we have our spaces <laughs> yeah. and and ventila i hear that you're working on a screenplay for the mm -hmm. novel is that correct and you, yeah you've done you've worked on screenplays before i think mm -hmm. Um, but what's it, how's it going? What's it like? How's it going? Well, it's interesting, you know, just the very beginning stages, but it's funny to think about how to adapt this into a screenplay and some of the characters that become more prominent. There's a, a character I'm quite fond of in the book named Gentle, and she's um, she's a kind of a tragic character who's definitely still feels like she lives in the 70s. Yulibi has a friend named um, Julia, and Julia's half-sister is named Gentle, and she is, um, everyone always makes fun of her. She's often can be seen um, on acid hanging from monkey bars naked, or she's you know, down the beach running around. Um, and she's, um, I'm making her a bigger character in the in the screenplay, because I feel like she is someone who just embodies what San Francisco, this, kind of embodies the animosity of the 80s, the, you know, all the bright colors and cleanliness is feeling toward the 70s at that point. And I think what happens to her is really, really um, tragic and something I could, would like to experiment more with in an actual script. I mean, there are other things too in a script that you that you think about a lot more just in terms of like, there are some things you can leave out. And book, the book is really about seeing and not seeing things. There's an inciting incident on the way to school one day, the four girls who are walking to school, three of them um, encounter a man in a car, in a vintage car. And he, there's two of the girls claim he does something and you will be, the character does not see him do this. And this is um, the fact that she won't support what the other girls say happened is actually what leads to her being ostracized from their group of friends. And so it's really about seeing and not seeing. And so I left out a lot of things in the book, like things that are kind of unclear about what you see or don't see. And one thing in screenplays though, you, you can't have a lot of ambiguity about what you see or don't see. You actually have to have to show it. So that's kind of interesting too, kind of bringing these unseen things to the forefront. Mm -hmm. um, and before I turn to some questions, I from questions from the audience, I want to ask what what's it like doing a virtual book tour? Normally, we would meet in person, mm -hmm. go out for a drink, mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Something like that. Um, but this is all virtual. How's it, how's it gone for you? And what what are the pros and cons of doing a book tour this way? Well, the cons are I forgot to charge my computer, so I just had to bend down to find the <laughs> battery. That's definitely a con. Um, but other cons, you know, there are some pros. I'll tell you the one pro I realized. So because everything, you know, back in the fall, I started realizing everything was going to be virtual. And I had some um, pre-book launch Zooms with some other people who have books coming out around now. And we, and it's been, so I feel like now I'm in this graduating class with these other these other writers who had books coming out now. And so we've all been cheering each other on and that's been really fun. I don't feel like I would have met them otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, um, you know, Brandon Hobson, um, Ellie Eaton, Andrew Graff, these writers who are super talented who all have books coming out now. And um, and I think it'll be really fun that when I do actually get to meet them, that I feel like we've kind of gone through this process together. So that's been a pro. Um, the con is that, yeah, I don't get to go out and, and see people afterwards and, and get to talk with them and interact in that way. But um, maybe, maybe next year. Can I ask if you're working on a new 
novel? I am working on a new novel. Um, it's going to take place over the course of a short period of time, um, probably a night or a weekend. Um, and I want, I want to challenge myself by doing that. So I'm looking at a lot of books in which that happens. So, yeah. That's great. Did you write a book? Did you write a book that took place in a short period of time? Uh, not, not overnight. Not, not overnight. What, how, what was the time period? A few weeks. A few weeks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, so I'm trying, I haven't ever done that before. So I'm trying to work in a condensed period of time. Okay, very reluctantly, I'm going to turn to other people's questions. Okay. Um, so um, this is from Eric Kumalo, uh, mm -hmm. who says, Lying by uh, Cicela Bock was my first college book to read, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. And his question, which you've probably, you've already answered, but if you wanted to add anything else, what motivated your title for the book, especially thinking of the political times when you started writing the book? So I've already I've already given it the political the alternate political title. Alternate, yes, um, but I'm, and we talked about the um, I think yeah I think the original title when it was to be a nonfiction book was just called Book of Lies, or I thought about just calling it Lies, you know, because I thought that'd be a great title, just Lies. But um, I'm glad you read Cicely Bach. Well, I, you know, she wrote that book Lying a long time ago, and it's interesting how around 2016 she just started seeing her name pop up again and again, and now she, you know, wrote a lot of interesting things about lying again and how her research just really held up. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Okay, so this question, is this Nin Nineveh? Nineveh, is that Nineveh? Nineveh. Hi, Nineveh. So. Nineveh um, was a co-founder of 826 Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she's asking, what do your parents think about Eulabee's parents? Do they see, <laughs> <laughs> do they see themselves? Um, you know, it's that's a good question. My parents, I think, are probably on this um, call as well, um, but I can't turn to them. But I could, if I was in a live audience, I could actually say, okay, I can turn the question over to them. Um, I think that they really, um, they're big fans of the book. They're very supportive parents. So I think that they are, um, they like the, the parents. They like the portrayal of the parents. Um, you know, I had to remind them at certain points that they weren't the characters in the book too you know i think everyone starts thinking that they're part of the book um but um yes thank you Nineveh, for that question i wish i could see you too okay so this is from carolyn platt um so she's with me in gushing over your book as everyone should as everyone should be and will be when they read your book um in addition to loving the tide I loved all of the references from the Lance nightgown to the Walkman and so much more. How did you decide that Maria was going to be called Maria Fabiola, which is mm -hmm. a fabulous name? Mm -hmm. It just felt so right. Oh, thank you so much for reading it and um, for liking the references too. I was thinking about the Lance nightgowns. It was something that came to me really late is how we all wore Lance nightgowns in the 80s and how funny that was because they were so... I don't know, Sarah, if you grew up wearing them at all, or they're just like, they're so grandmotherly, like, and these flannel nightgowns with lace, and, the, and we go down to in downtown San Francisco to the Lands Factory and pick out these nightgowns, and I'm like, what were we doing? You know, it was like, really like wearing, like, it, it, they were ridiculous nightgowns for girls to be wearing and wanting to be wearing. Um, Maria Fabiola, I'm so glad you asked about that. I actually have known a couple Fabiolas in my life, and like, really, their names were Fabiola, and they were wonderful people. Um, I knew a teenage girl named Fabiola, and I was in my 30s, and I had a friend, um, in my, you know, maybe 10 years ago named Fabiola. And I just always loved the name and both of them were fabulous people. So it seemed really fitting. And I was trying to find a name for this character that would just be fabulous. And I wanted, um, and so I looked up the name Fabiola and I love that, you know, it could be Italian, the, pri the president of Argentina, his, um, his domestic partner is named Fabiola. Um, I just felt like it was a name that was like a powerful name. Um, I felt like there was, a, I already had the fact this joke in mind, I wanted the boys to call her Maria Fabu Fabulous. So it's, you know, whatever, just a dumb joke, but it felt like it was already built in. And I wanted a name to be, um, later in life, you, well, I don't want to skip ahead too much, but you find out that she goes by a different name when she's older. Um, it's not quite as fabulous. In fact, her um, her husband drops the name, just calls her Maria, but she's still fabulous. And I, and I wanted a name that could be altered depending on who was talking to her. But thank you so much for asking that question. Talking about skipping towards the end, I didn't really say too much about the, the end because I don't want to give anything away, but I, I think I'm not giving anything away by saying that uh, in the end, this is another example of your humor that was just 
I just found fascinating. I'm thinking about it a lot after having read the book, which is um, Eulabi is talking about, I think I'm getting this right. She's talking about someone that they went to school with who is um, outsourcing, a consult, outsourcing intuition or a consultant for, you know, if you can't figure out what your intuition is, I guess. Right. Consult- this person goes around and helps. Yeah. You. Which yeah. I think is absolutely brilliant. Well, that uh, happened. That's a true story, actually. Oh my God. My, I was at my friend Gina's house, and she had a friend. Oh. She was telling about someone else, another friend of theirs. Oh, I hope I'm not getting anyone in trouble who outsourced the intuition. Oh. And this friend um, said to me, "You have to put that in your next book." And I said, "You know what? I actually I, done. Like I, I, I love that so much. It's just a metaphor that we like when people when they start outsourcing everything." Um, they actually start outsourcing their intuition because they can't trust themselves anymore. What does that say about how far we've come when we can't do that? Wow. Wow. Okay. I wonder how much those consultants charge. (laughs) I don't know if I would be a good intuition for somebody. I think I would actually get really mischievous and just get someone in trouble a lot. (laughs) Yeah, but as right as right as we can make things up. I mean, how would we think that? You know, yeah. you would sounds- be a good you would be a good intuition because you would be really trustworthy, and then you could just like be totally mischievous. Just- <laughs> I think, yeah. Well, we can talk offline about maybe we talk offline. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Consult us at four thirty a.m. That's the best time <laughs> to tap into your into your intuition. Yeah, exactly. I can make sure everyone's not getting, no one's getting any sleep. Uh- <laughs> um, okay, here is. Here is a question I would find to be difficult, but Uh Uh what is it about San Francisco that's essential to the plot? Mm -hmm. Um, So I sorry, this came comes from Betsy Weiss. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but okay. Well, but it has to do with the San Francisco. I felt like this growing up too that San Francisco was just this destination place for so many people coming from the East Coast and everything's like about the gold rush. I and mean, there's this sense too, that even though the gold rush was, you know, a long time ago, there is this, you know, sense now that the gold rush still happened in Silicon Valley. And even in the eighties, I felt like everyone felt going to San Francisco for some Mecca, for something to, where they were going to discover something. And I felt like that was really important. Like this book wouldn't have the same, wouldn't be the same if it was set in a different town, like on the East Coast, for example, and like Darien, Connecticut, where some of the people from the book actually come from when they moved to San Francisco. And so in the fact, like I mentioned before, the fact that San Francisco in the 80s was like a teenage girl, you know, I'm always amazed like how young California is and how young San Francisco is. When you go back to buildings on the East Coast, even you see that, you know, what year they were, they were built and what year the plaques are from. And you think about how California didn't exist then. And so the fact that it was um, takes place in California was very it just kind of I couldn't have placed it anywhere else. But um, thank you for asking that. Cause it made me realize how much it was important to set it to set it where I did. Um, and then there's a question from Teresa Drenick. I won't read the full question because it sort of gives a little bit away, I think. Um, but basically, the question is about there is um, uh, molestation uh, or an incident of molest- molestation in your mm-hmm. narrative. Um, um, that perhaps has shaped a character's whole life and their mm-hmm. sense of their self. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe just if you want to talk about that. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. I think there's a scene that I felt was very, um, it was very 80s. There's a scene where something happens to one of the girls or two scenes actually, and no mm-hmm. one talks about them. And I think that was part of, you know, I was talking about how the book is about like, things that are seen and not seen. I also think so much about the eighties where things were things that were not talked about, you know, yeah. and the fact that I feel like girls now being raised would know right away to go talk to someone if something like that happened or something like what happens in the book happens. I don't want to, I'm trying to deliberately be vague here about mm-hmm. what the incidents are. Um, and I think that that was also a choice I made um, because it was being said in the eighties that they, they wouldn't talk about it. You know, they wouldn't tell anyone and they would just keep moving along and, and also be so wrapped up in their sexuality and their friends are starting to do things with boys and they don't really know what the lines are with what's okay and what's not okay. And I think that's just emblematic of being from a very different time period, even though that was only, you know, a few decades ago. Mm-hmm. So, Vandela, I'm I'm interested, I you know, I know that when we write books, we, we do research and, and mm-hmm. as you were going back to the 80s, you would have done... Well, I, well, actually, let me just say, what, what sort of what sort of research did you do? 
so the research I did um, was really trying to think about what this character would have done. So for example, I was I knew that music would be an important part of her life because music was a big part of my life, but I had to think what would her favorite band have been, for example, and I decided that her favorite band would have been the Psychedelic Furs, which was not my favorite band, but that was, you know, the character's not me. And so I went to a couple of Psychedelic Furs concerts to, to research what that would have been like. Other things I researched, um, you know, a lot of it was, I'm trying to think what else I researched besides going to Psychedelic Furs concerts. Um, I researched a lot of films, um, especially I went back and watched Hitchcock films like Vertigo because I knew that I wanted to have some Hitchcockian elements to the, to the book. And so thinking there's a scene that happens toward the end of the book that takes place on Knob Hill which is where Vertigo, a lot of Vertigo is set. And there's a restaurant called Ernie's that's in, in Vertigo. And if Ernie's still existed today, I would have had the people in the book go to Ernie's, but instead they had to go to another restaurant because it's not there anymore. They go to the Big Four Bar, which I also love because if you go there, all the photographs there have pictures of the, you know, the railways and building the railroad that come out to San Francisco. And so I, that kind of research, just like going back to places and, and I, is there actually, I've been to that bar a lot, but I have never, and, and I've never actually looked at the photos before. So I had to do research, like actually looking what the, what the booths look like, and, um, and think about that and what they represent. And I was so happy to find that the, actually the photographs meant something to the book and the fact that it was set in California. Um, so Will has just written. By the end of the book, I was thinking Maria Fibiola instead of Fabiola. Oh so, yeah, that's good. So. <laughs> Fibiola, but you know the one, yeah. I, that would be that would be a great name for her as well. Um, but yeah, I have to find it's funny. My friends, my, the two people I know named Fabiola, I kept trying to track them down before the book came out to tell them that I'd written this book, and it wasn't about them. And that I love, you know, I really like them so much, and I love their name. But um, hopefully, maybe now I'll hear from them, and I can tell them that. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I just want to. I want to again just reiterate what a wonderful book this is, and I. You know, I am your friend, so I wouldn't say it was a terrible book, but <laughs> but it is it it really is a great book, and I think I I'm in a very good position to say this because I have read over the last nine months over fifty books from front to cover because I've been judging various book wow. prizes. I was going to ask you why you read fifty books. Yeah. yeah, I normally would not read that many books, mm -hmm. um, and it's just. It's just a phenomenal book. And so I, those of you who have not read it already, you're in for a real treat. And um, Vandela, it's just been wonderful talking to you. Um, I think and we're coming it's up. Lovely, it's been lovely talking to you, Sarah. And please, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but please. No, no. Her. Yes, please do. Thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I just also just want to say one other thing, which is you. there's such a generosity of spirit uh, Vandela, so I just admire you as a writer, but I also just admire you as a person and your generosity oh. um, is really, it's just really striking and, and appreciated. So thank you. This has been such an honor and thank you, Books and Books. Thank you. Thank Very you, much. Thank you, Books and Books. Thank and you. I can tell you that the pros of virtual events are conversations like this one, but the cons are not being able to fold up our chairs, go to the next room and have you sign books, you know, and and see you in person. But thank you so much on behalf of Books and Books, on behalf of Miami Book Fair. I wanna thank all the viewers watching from everywhere. Remind you again, if you haven't already read the book, I know we have some people that have, but please order it by just pressing the green button. We'll ship it right out to you. We have curbside pickup at all of our stores. And so thank you for this remarkable conversation. Thank you. And also, I want to say when um, COVID is in the rearview mirror, please do go to Books and Books in Miami if you haven't been there before. It's such a beautiful bookstore. I love it so much. And I really am looking forward to stepping inside your store again. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good night, everyone. Stay good safe night. and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Sarah.